So it's what you eat, when you eat, nutritional supplements, skincare, and non-invasive treatments. If you work on all five of those, I would estimate anywhere from 70 to 90% of people can avoid invasive procedures and be happy with their appearance. Really looking at nutrient dense foods is a big thing that you can do to help to slow down and even reverse the aging process. Red light therapy. What did the study say? They found that after twice weekly treatments, after just one month, a statistically significant improvement in wrinkles, elasticity, and hydration. Hey everyone, before diving into the episode, I want to take a moment to invite you into our Mind Body Green ecosystem, where you can explore the infinite possibilities of health and well being. All you have to do is click the subscribe button to hear more thought provoking interviews with leaders in the health space. I am so grateful for all of you who have tuned in over the years, and let me tell you, it's only going to get better. So, in the book, you talk about these five lifestyle conditions that can cause accelerated aging on the inside and out. You've got nutrient depletion, inflammation, collagen degradation, free radical damage, and buildup of cellular waste. Can you walk us through each one of these? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the first one is nutrient depletion that you mentioned. And nutrient depletion, essentially, this is something that you know, interestingly, I hear this from my um, natural medicine, alternative medicine colleagues, um, but you don't hear it a lot from people in traditional healthcare and medicine. And it's the idea that the food that we're eating today is less nutritious than it used to be. And so there's this belief in holistic medicine circles that the soil has been depleted due to industrial farming practices, and the food that we're eating now doesn't have the same nutrients as before. But what does the science say? And there actually was a study uh, that was performed between 1950 and 1999. So this is 49 years where they looked at the nutritional content of various fruits and vegetables, and they found a significant reduction over those 49 years of six key nutrients. And three of them really stood out to me. Vitamin C, iron, and protein. Protein being obviously a huge one because it's a macronutrient all in its own. And so this idea that we have that our food is not as nutritious as it used to be is a real one and it has actually been proven by studies like this. There was also a study that looked at, uh, it was dozens and dozens of the most popular diets out there and found that every single one of them fell short of supplying the US uh, RDA recommended daily allowances of various nutrients. And so we do know that this belief in holistic circles that our food isn't as nutritious as it used to be has been proven. And, and the study I mentioned initially ended in 1999. I mean, that was like 24 years ago. What are we dealing with now? And so really looking at nutrient dense foods is a big thing that you can do to help to slow down and even reverse the aging process. On a personal level, I experienced iron deficiency. I was tending to eat a bit more plant-based. Uh, and I'm a pretty good eater. I don't eat a ton of processed food. And all of a sudden I developed an iron deficiency. I was like, this makes, this makes no sense. But sure enough, I developed one. I'm eating more meat now and, and, and supplementing, but I, I, I've come around to like, accept that this is just the world we live in in 2024. Like you, nutrient gaps are real. Yeah, and I think that's where supplements can really come into play. I mean, you really cannot supplement yourself out of a bad diet, but if, you know, even somebody like yourself, where you obviously eat a better diet than the vast majority of Americans, that still wasn't enough to prevent you from having a major nutrient deficiency. And so focusing, just like you mentioned, on whole foods, focusing on real foods, limiting any amount of processed, especially ultra-processed foods that you eat, and then adding the supplements in definitely I mean, that's absolutely necessary in today's day and age. So how does the lack of, it was iron, vitamin C, and what was the third one again? Protein. Pro protein, of course. How does that age us? How does that, how do, you know, let's talk about the vanity here. You know, it's, it's, one, it's one thing I get my lab work, I'm like, okay, you know, a little bit, need a little bit more iron, need a little bit more C, you know, protein's another conversation, but it's like, oh wait, this is affecting my, my skin? Hold up here. 
Yeah. So, I mean, first thing, you know, we mentioned vitamin C. Vitamin C is an antioxidant. We'll talk a little bit more about that with uh, free radicals and oxidation. But uh, vitamin C is also absolutely essential in the production of collagen, which is one of the other things we'll talk about here with degradation of collagen. So collagen is a large protein. And in order for your body to construct collagen, it's a large protein, but it's also encoded in these, uh, or it is formed in fibrils. And if we do not have sufficient vitamin C in our diet, then that collagen is not able to be produced efficiently. And that's why sailors, you know, you may remember back in middle school and high school biology class uh, that we would learn that, oh, these sailors would run out of fresh fruit and vegetables as they're going on these large journeys overseas way back, you know, in the discovery, the age of discovery. And they would develop scurvy. They would get these sores uh, inside their mouths and, and these sores on their skin because literally they did not have vitamin C to help to either heal the collagen that was damaged or create new and support collagen. Protein is very interesting and we can kind of delve into go into now the idea of uh, de collagen degradation. So collagen composes 70 to 80% of the thickness of our skin. 78% of our skin is made of collagen. And that collagen is what makes our skin nice and firm and tight and youthful. Uh, and I, the way I describe it is kind of like the logs of a log cabin. And when you're young, those logs are nice and tight. That's the collagen. But what happens is after we hit about our mid-20s, we start to lose about 1% of the thickness of our collagen in our skin every year. That increases to 2% a year in women after they undergo menopause. And so our skin gets thinner, the collagen gets thinner. And that's why you may see women who are in their 70s and their 80s, and their skin can be just tissue paper thin to the point where even a scratch can actually tear their skin open. So really getting enough protein, because collagen once again is a large protein, is so, so important to keeping our collagen nice and firm and youthful. And so collagen degradation is a big thing. That also come, brings up to mind collagen supplements as well. Yeah, for someone who's going to supplement with collagen, what do you generally like to see in terms of amount? Each one is a little bit different. I think the most important thing that I would recommend, because I find that the different collagen supplements do contain different amounts. I don't know that there's a standard amount. And even the studies I've looked at haven't really been very specific in how much collagen is given. Uh, the important couple of things to keep in mind with collagen supplements, though, as far as how to take it and, and, and all of that. The first thing is that you want to look for a hydrolyzed, hydrolyzed collagen peptides. So I mentioned earlier that collagen is a large protein, and that protein will get broken down in your stomach. And so companies that have high quality collagen in general will um, break that collagen down into individual amino acids or groups of peptides, and that allows the body to absorb it more readily. The other important thing with collagen supplements is that you need to keep in mind that there are five different types of collagen. Now, three of them are the most important. So type one collagen is in your hair, your skin, your nails, and your bones. Type two collagen is in your joints. Type three is in your muscle. Type four and five aren't as important. Four is in your kidneys and five is in your placenta. Um, but really type one through three, those are the important ones. But let's say you are taking collagen for some joint issues. Let's say you've got some fibromyalgia or you've got some arthritis in your joints. Um, then it's important to make sure that your collagen supplement has type two in it because that's gonna help with your joints. Type one can help as well just because it's in your bones and the bo bones and the joints kind of work together, uh, but it's not quite the same. A and the same thing, if you're taking a collagen that's like, let's say type two, that's not going to help your hair. That's not going to help your uh, skin and your nails at all. Right. And inflammation, that's such a big, broad term that we all love in this space. Let's talk about inflammation. <laughs> Yeah, so inflammation can be acute and it can be chronic. And this is a really, really important distinction to make. So acute inflammation is something that actually can be a very good thing. So you get a cut on your skin, your body creates inflammation around that cut to help it to heal. Without inflammation, we cannot heal injuries. In acute inflammation can also be really helpful for us to rejuvenate our body, okay? And it's this idea of hormesis. Um, but you can use this principle of hormesis where you put your body under a certain strain or significant stress uh, in a controlled fashion and your body can actually use that to recover in a more youthful kind of an anti-aging way. So this is something that we see in our skin all the time with acute trauma to our skin. So let's say microneedling, a very popular treatment in, in aesthetic medicine, creates acute inflammation, acute trauma to the skin using tiny little needle pokes. 
Lasers do it using light energy to create heat. Chemical peels do it using uh, acids. So acute inflammation can be a really good thing because it's necessary for our body to heal and it also can help our body to rejuvenate itself. But that is different than chronic inflammation and chronic inflammation is in general very harmful. And the thing that I usually focus on really with chronic inflammation, the number one cause of chronic inflammation of our bodies is excess sugar. So sugar consumption can cause chronic inflammation. It can damage our skin via two main mechanisms. The first one is glycation. So sugar molecules can bond to the collagen fibers and the elastin fibers in our skin. And I mentioned earlier that, the, that our collagen is like the logs of a log cabin. And as we get older, those logs become frayed. They start to fall apart. They get weaker. Our skin gets rougher in texture. It gets droopier. It gets looser. So what sugar does is sugar can come along and it can act actually bind to that bond, to that collagen, and causing those collagens to become, fibers become even more kinked. And this collagen-sugar hybrid, this connection, are called advanced glycation end products, otherwise known as AGEs. And AGEs are damaging to our skin for obvious reasons because, once again, the collagen that we want in those tight fibers becomes permanently kinked. On that note, the dietary consumption of sugar is inflammatory and can ultimately hurt our skin health. There's also a growing school of thought around seed oils and seed oils being highly inflammatory. And I've seen a lot of conversation. I don't know if there's real science there, not only damaging the skin, but also connecting seed oils to sun damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't seen a lot of evidence with sun damage, but I think where seed oils can really come into play as well is, free, is in free radical production. And that will be the next thing. So free radicals and oxidation, that's the third or fourth main cause of aging of the skin, free radicals and, ox and uh, oxidation. So uh, this is going back to our high school chemistry and all of that. And really basically the way that this works is that there are, you know, our body, um, we have a certain me metabolic rate, metabolism. Our body, the fact that we are alive, our body creates waste products called free radicals. And these are made by our body just naturally. Everybody who's alive, your body creates free radicals. Well, free radicals can actually damage uh, our cells, the DNA of our cells, if given the chance. They basically attack the cells and they steal electrons from them. So our body's natural defense against free radicals are antioxidants. And if you've been listening to this podcast, you've heard a lot about antioxidants in the past, eating antioxidants, applying antioxidants to your skin. Antioxidants neutralize free radicals. And this is basically this kind of a give and take mechanism that occurs in our body, kind of a homeostasis, ideally. So if you're eating, a, if you're having like a, a, eating a healthy diet, you're having a healthy lifestyle, then the idea is that your body is not going to create more free radicals than it can naturally neutralize using its antioxidants. But there are outside sources of free radicals as well. The pollution in the air, smoking. Uh, ultra-processed and fried foods, these all can contribute to the free radicals that basically will attack our skin. And at some point, you can develop so many free radicals by once again doing those types of things and eating things like seed oils or foods fried in these seed oils at high temperatures. And now your body's got so many free radicals that it cannot handle it with its natural amount of antioxidants and your body undergoes a period of oxidative stress where it's getting overrun by these free radicals, damaging the DNA of your cells, causing you to age prematurely. So what do you do to fight that? Antioxidants, once again. So your body will create antioxidants on its own, but you can also ingest antioxidants via colorful fruits and vegetables, okay? It's the actual pigment in those fruits and vegetables that are the antioxidants, and you can apply antioxidants to the surface of your skin as well via the same deal, antioxidants like vitamin C on the surface of the skin to fight free radical damage. Hmm. And the last one, buildup of cellular waste. So this is really interesting because this is something that plastic surgeons and dermatologists don't talk a lot about, okay? So you can talk to a dermatologist or a plastic surgeon and, and you'll say, hey, you know, what's aging your skin? And they can talk to you about free radicals. They may talk to you about chronic inflammation. Uh, they'll definitely, they could talk to you about collagen degradation. But one thing that we don't really pay much attention to is this buildup of cellular waste. And so kind of like um, with the production of free radicals, our body will create waste products just by the 
fact that we're being alive. So inside our cells, there can be a buildup of cellular waste products. These are waste products like proteins, used organelles, and even discarded and old mitochondria that aren't functioning so well. That can actually build up in our cells and cause our cells to function less efficiently, essentially as if you were older. And the way the body basically targets this and gets rid of this intracellular waste, allowing those cells to function more efficiently and more essentially younger, uh, is by a process called autophagy. Autophagy means self-eating. And essentially what it does is it is a cellular recycling process where your body, when it runs out of fuel, will then use this intracellular waste products, these organelles and proteins, for fuel for the cell, essentially recycling them. By removing this from the cell, it causes the cell to function more efficiently and essentially more youthfully. And this is a process that we, that we need our body to undergo for us to continue to age on a slower basis, essentially. But the problem is, is that the, uh, the standard American lifestyle and the standard American diet does not allow for periods where we don't feed ourselves. I mean, we are constantly stuffing our mouths with food. And the studies are showing that you need a minimum of about 12 hours of fasting to get that autophagy process going. You have to stop eating for a good 12 hours at least to really rev up that autophagy process. Uh, and so that's where intermittent fasting can really come into play. A lot of people look at intermittent fasting as a way to maybe lose a little bit of weight, a way to improve their uh, metabolic flexibility and things, but a lot of people don't realize that that is actually a great way to help to rejuvenate the skin and turn the clock back on the aging of your skin as well. So in terms of eating, we just talked about intermittent fasting and, and avoiding eating for at least 12 hours. How can I eat my way to better skin? What's on your anti-aging grocery list? Yeah, so the first thing I encourage people to consider are uh, good, healthy sources of protein. So once again, collagen degradation, loss of collagen is a huge deal with getting older and collagen is a protein. So you wanna look at healthy sources of protein. Uh, ideally, this is gonna be for those people who are carnivores eating meat, okay? And and like what you have covered before on your podcast really well, I'm definitely a fan of eating grass-fed beef, pastured pork and chicken, uh, wild-caught fish. These are gonna be healthier sources of meat. They're also gonna have, in general, better uh, fats. So you're gonna have, let's say, more omega-3 fatty acids in general in grass-fed beef, more conjugated linoleic acid in, in grass-fed beef as well. Uh, the fat uh, content, the omega-3 content also with a uh, wild caught fish is gonna be better. But ideally looking at healthy sources of protein would be the first thing that I would look at. Uh, and that would then help once again for collagen degradation, that would help with nutrient depletion. When we're looking, however, at things like inflammation, then there are certain categories of food that I would really focus on. So there are certain types of foods that are definitely anti-inflammatory. And if you're looking at that, then um, good healthy fats are anti-inflammatory. And so I typically would focus on omega-3 fatty acid rich foods. So these are wild caught cold water fish. So you're looking at salmon, tuna, trout, mackerel, sardines. These are all great sources of omega-3 fatty acids. And also you wanna look at good healthy sources of monounsaturated fatty acids. Okay, the other source of good anti-inflammatory fats. And so you're gonna look at olives, avocados, olive oil, nuts, and seeds all those great sources of those monounsaturated fatty acids. So for each of these kind of causes of aging, um, you can really kind of pick different sources of food. Also with, with uh, reducing inflammation, I'm a big fan of fermented foods as well. And do you have a view on dairy? So yeah, I'm not a big fan of dairy. I still intake some dairy just because uh, I do like my pizza. <laughs> and the one place I'll get dairy typically is there. Um, you know, it's interesting. My wife is a pediatrician and throughout her whole career, up until the last several years, she encouraged all of her patients and the parents to feed her their children milk. And this was because the dogma in her field is that kids should grow up drinking milk. Well, we don't have any milk in our house. We haven't had milk in our house now since she has, you know, done some research and looked at a lot more of kind of alternative medicine practices and finding that, gee, is actually milk can be potentially harmful. We had a family member of ours, a child who was having uh, some issues with uh, ticks and uh, Tourette type symptoms. And when that person was taken off of milk and dairy products, they went away. Uh, and so this is something that's been very eye opening. Um, you know, I know that there's a trend now towards full fat dairy and maybe dairy not being that bad for you. Uh, when you're looking at skin health, I would disagree. Um, 
interestingly, <laughs> as, as alternative medicine now is kind of getting back to liking dairy, some people are, traditional medicine is starting to go away from dairy. It's like they're behind the curve. Uh, and it's funny because a few years ago, I would post about how I'm not a fan of dairy and, and with hormones and the antibiotics and, and the inflammatory nature of it. And I'd have people comment attacking me about it. Now, once again, it's, there are traditional medicine docs and even dermatologists who are saying, yeah, if you've got acne issues, first thing to do, try going off of dairy and see how you feel. It's, it's really entering the mainstream now. Well, was, this is one where it seems like quality matters. If you're referencing hormones and antibiotics, that would be conventional dairy versus are you having 100% grass-fed dairy? Yeah, but I think even with that, aren't, aren't we still dealing with hormones because it's naturally the product is from a lactating cow? Co correct, but no, there's, no, there's nothing artificial. Yeah, so I mean, you may not be dealing also with antibiotic residues and all of that, but I still think you have hormones with the milk that just isn't going to be naturally there. Um, but either way, it's not something I think in general, when you're looking at what's good for the skin and skin health, um, dairy is in general inflammatory. And so it is something that I do encourage people to go off of or really more to limit. You know, I think it's hard in, in today's society not to have any dairy at all, um, but to try to limit it. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's in general. I think yogurt for some people that can be a good source of probiotics for them. And here in our society, there's you know, not a lot of people get probiotics through their food. Yogurt's really obviously the most common source. What about coffee? So coffee, I think is great. It just comes down to what you put in it. Uh, coffee is filled with antioxidants. And so I, I look at it in two different ways. And I used to drink a lot more coffee than I do now. Uh, the first thing with coffee is it is filled with a lot of antioxidants. So on the surface, I think coffee is a very skin healthy food. The negatives obviously is caffeine and caffeine can be a diuretic. And so you can dry out your skin a little bit with it. Uh, I'm also not a big fan that it is addictive. And so in general, I'm not a fan of anything that causes your body to become addicted to it. And on a different note, I used to drink a lot of uh, coffee with collagen in it. And I thought, oh, you know, it's like, it's a double, double whammy here. I get the, the benefit of the antioxidants in the coffee and I'll throw a little bit of collagen in it. So you get the benefit of that. And then sometimes I'd mix that even with some butter coffee but the problem, honestly, is I went to my dentist and she's like, hey, you've been drinking a lot of coffee. <laughs> and I was like, uh, yeah, because I could tell your teeth are getting stained. So I'm like, okay, so now actually um, we'll drink my collagen in hot water in the morning and, and that's fine. And, and my teeth are staying white, so that's good. Something else that can stain, red wine. What about red wine? Yeah. So, you know, I think that too lately has been a bit of a controversy. Uh, there has been this uh, idea of the French paradox where red wine is filled with antioxidants. The big one is resveratrol. Is that contributing to the longevity and um, the heart healthy benefits of red wine potentially, or is the alcohol in it uh, a net negative? And I've always believed that in general, not drinking alcohol is going to be better than drinking it. If you do drink anything, then a glass of wine a night at most. Uh, red wine specifically is what I would recommend. Um, I do think you get a lot of antioxidants with it. White wine, not as good as red just because it hasn't had the contact with the grapes for as long. Um, but the red wine having good antioxidants, especially resveratrol. If you're going to drink wine, then that's what I would do. And once again, just limit it to one glass a day. I love it. I love a good glass of red wine. Usually dry farms, dry farm wine. And I am a fan of dry farm wines. I actually included that in the book. Um, I actually, you know, the crazy thing though, Jason, is that I can't get, I used to get dry farm here in Michigan. I'm in the Detroit area and the state does not allow it anymore. So we used to get a carton of it. I think every two months we had a carton and I would hand it out to my employees and bring it home. And it's the only wine that I can drink that I would feel fine afterwards. I don't itch afterwards and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but then there's something that happened with the state of Michigan where they only allow direct wine purchases. And because Dry Farms Wine, they don't necessarily produce all of their wine. You know, some of it, um, they're an intermediary. They won't, they can't ship it to, to Michigan. Todd, the founder, is a friend. He also lives in Miami now. We, 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 we will solve this. We will offline. We got to get you some wine. <laughs> you gotta get, gotta get the right legislatures this has only been the last few years and i've been waiting and waiting it's like oh i still can't get it now you've got your issue <laughs> important issue to vote on so you, we haven't talked about grains do you have a view on grains 
Yeah, so you know, we have this thing in the book, it's a 21 day jump start. And one of the things that we did is we took people off of grains and we took them off of dairy. You know, for me, you know, we know that 1% of the population has celiac. And you know, when I was a traditionally trained physician, um, we didn't learn a whole lot about nutrition back then. This has been stuff that I've learned uh, thousands and thousands of hours of studying it afterwards. Uh, for me, I think that there is a fairly high percentage of the population, a lot more than we may think, maybe 10%, maybe even more, who are really sensitive to the effects of gluten. Uh, I myself, I do eat gluten, but I limit it because I know that if I eat too much of it, I feel crummy, I get sleepy, I get tired. And I think that it, it's interesting because we took people off of gluten and dairy, we took them off of uh, processed foods just for three weeks and people saw these just great changes in how they felt and their energy level and things. So my recommendation in general with gluten is there are people who, I think there's a lot of people who are sensitive to gluten. Gluten makes them feel real crummy. It can be inflammatory even for their skin and may find that they uh, their skin looks inflamed, but they have no idea. And unless they go off of it, and I typically recommend people, uh, and in my book, that's what I recommend, is just take two to three weeks, go off of gluten and just see how you feel. You know, maybe you don't feel any different. That's okay. And if you don't, okay. But I bet that there's a pretty big percentage of people that go off of it are going to feel more energy, they're going to feel less tired, their digestion is going to feel better, they may feel less gassy. Um, and this is something I think that traditional medicine has failed in educating people, whereas uh, alternative medicine has really done a good job. Yeah, I don't think traditional medicine does a good job with elimination diets where let's just remove things and see how you feel and you can learn a lot about yourself. I think it's a really, it's a common sense thing. And I do believe in bio-individuality. I don't think everybody fits in the same, uh, you know, in the same kind of structure and everybody's body doesn't react the same way. It's, it's funny because medicine is very good at finding large patterns. And so if there's certain things where we can find a pattern of thousands of people and in general, people follow the same pattern, that's fine. But not everybody's gonna follow that just because the vast majority of the public may. You know, there are gonna be outliers and unfortunately, I think traditional medicine is not good at dealing with those outliers and saying, hey, you know what, your body reacts a little bit differently. You know, your lab may be quote unquote normal for what we normally see, but for you, that lab is abnormal, you know, because obviously your body is not functioning the way that it should. It's the same thing with gluten, you know, it's like maybe the, the majority of people can tolerate and feel just fine, but there is a percentage of people who just don't do well with it. And so those are people that may not, you know, be represented in these studies so much because it's a small segment. And are you having Wonder Bread or are you having like great organic fermented sourdough? Yeah, you know, is it, or is your bread sprouted? Is it a sprouted grain versus, yeah. So I think that a lot of that, you know, then now we also know that there's different um, strains of grain and, you know, there are those people who go to Europe and they can eat gluten and do just fine, yet they come here to the States and it's not good. Uh, unfortunately, it's, you know, we don't have a lot of control over that and that's what makes it so difficult. So we believe in lifestyle modification first. And I will add, I think there's a growing consensus that lifestyle can only get you so far. And that's where, you know, pharmaceutical interventions or, or in this case, cosmetic interventions come in. And the example that comes to mind, we had Peter Tia on the show and we talked about cardiovascular disease and he is very passionate about ApoB and believes that lifestyle can only lower ApoB to a certain degree and maybe get you to like 10%, 20% risk of cardiovascular disease because everyone more or less has it. And his view is you need to take a statin to bring your risk to zero. So if there's some people are going to be okay with an ApoB level and they're like low 70s or 60s. And he thinks like you kind of can't go further with lifestyle. But he says with the statin, you can get it to the 30s, which is like childlike level, zero risk. And I think that's a really interesting concept where if you're concerned about heart disease and you're saying, well, I can get you to zero risk, I think a lot of people would raise their hand. And these people could be eating the best diets in the world, have the best genetics, but they say, I don't want 10%, I want zero. And so with that said, in terms of our skin health, terms of anti-aging, how far can lifestyle get us? We're going to, the face is going to age. The skin is going to age. Like in your view, like how far can we get with eating the best diet, doing all the exercise? we got great genes, but you know what? I'm sorry. You're, you're, it's going to be impossible with lifestyle to look a day younger than 65 or whatever that number is. 
How do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So I guess the way I look at it is there is probably about 70 to 90, anywhere between 70 to 90% of people where if they incorporate the types of things I recommend in the book. So it's what you eat, when you eat, nutritional supplements, skincare, and non-invasive treatments. If you work on all five of those, I would estimate anywhere from 70 to 90% of people can avoid invasive procedures and be happy with their appearance. Now, the fact is that we're all going to age. No matter what type of diet you eat, no matter what you put on your skin, you are going to age. You are going to see those wrinkles form. You are going to see the skin sag. You're going to see those jowls form. Uh, and then it comes down to how do you feel about your appearance and what are you willing to do about it? So, you know, for me, I still operate two days a week. Uh, I still do facelifts. I do eyelid lifts. I do tons of types of different types of procedures because there are those things that really, if you have it, we cannot get rid of it um, without going under the knife. But I really feel that that is going to be limited to anywhere from that 10 to 30% of people who are not going to be happy unless they get rid of those things. So where is number one surgery comes in, typically there's one thing that, that we cannot do without surgery, and that is get rid of excess hanging skin. So if you've got skin hanging from your neck, if you've got real big jowls, if you've got skin uh, of your upper eyelids that's drooping, if you've got if you've had four kids and you've got skin from your belly that's hanging down and you've got rashes and skin irritation underneath it, the only way to get rid of that skin is to cut it out, is to do a lift, a surgical lift, but these surgical lifts create lengthy scars. And so there is a big drawback from it. Um, so that's really where surgery comes in. Injections are a bit of a different story. You know, anything that I'm recommending short of surgery is not going to change the architecture of your aging. So for example, our face ages in three dimensions. We lose one of the one of those dimensions is that we lose volume. And nothing that I'm recommending to you uh, naturally is going to cause the volume to increase. Okay, you're going to lose fat in your face. The, the muscles and the bones are going to atrophy very gradually. Um, and that's where interventions can come into play. Same with wrinkles. You know, if you've got a deep line between in your furrow between your brows, there's no food you're going to eat that's going to make it go away. There's no uh, cream that we can put on that will cause it to disappear. Uh, that's where Botox and other injections can help with it. And so really, that's kind of how I would look at it. You know, there's some people who are really happy with somebody saying, hey, you've got beautiful skin, uh, even though they may have some lines and some droopiness of skin, that's okay. My mother-in-law, Never had anything invasive done. Never had Botox, no filler. I've not done a facelift on her. She has beautiful skin, but she's got some loose skin under her neck. It doesn't bother her, so she's really happy the way she is. Uh, whereas my mom, who just visited just uh, last night, last night <laughs> we had dinner and then came back to my office and I injected Botox in between her brows and a little bit of filler into her cheeks. What a great son. <laughs> and I didn't charge her for it too. <laughs> So what, what are the best non-invasive treatments? So the first thing that I would recommend, so if you're listening to this podcast right now, and, and you let's say you are on a budget and you don't have the, uh, the financial means to go to a med spa or a dermatologist or a plastic surgeon, that's okay. The first thing I would recommend starting with is red light therapy. Now, red light therapy comes in different ways. You can get a handheld device where you can treat a quadrant of your face at a time. I find those to be kind of a, of a pain because it takes a while to do it. Uh, there are tabletop stands that I think are great where you can basically treat your whole face at one time. There are creepy looking Hannibal Lecter masks that you can wear that will light up and you can scare your friends and your spouse. Uh, and then there are whole beds that some people will get into. So red light therapy I find is really interesting because if you go to plastic surgery meetings and you ask a plastic surgeon, hey, what do you think about red light? They'll look at you with a blank stare. If you go to a alternative medicine meeting and you say, hey, what do you think about red light? Everybody's talking about it. And oh, I've got a bed, I've got this, I've got that. Um, and so it's really this interesting thing that hasn't really gotten into the mainstream of, of plastic surgery and even dermatology very much. Yet there are a lot of studies that show that it seems to help. So the idea behind red light therapy is that that red light basically contributes energy to the mitochondria in your cells. Mitochondria are the powerhouses of your cells and it causes those mitochondria to create more ATP or essentially more energy. And so it's this idea that you're transferring energy to your cells to cause those cells to basically function in a more uh, efficient and more basically youthful manner. 
So what did the study say? Because, you know, in medicine, it's always, well, I'm an evidence, you know, based physician. I only look at evidence-based protocols and stuff. So there are studies that have looked at red light therapy for anti-aging benefits, especially basically skin benefits. And there was one study that took, that was a split face study where they took the face, they split it in half, not physically, just to, to treat it. And one side of the face, they used a sham laser, basically, or sham light, basically didn't do anything. And then the other light, the other side they did with the red light therapy. And they found that after twice weekly treatments, after just one month, a significant, statistically significant improvement in wrinkles, elasticity, and hydration. And they found that the collagen was thicker in the side that was treated with a red light therapy device. And that was just four weeks of, of treatment. Um, and so there have been multiple studies that have showed that using a red light device can really help anti-aging skin. And the best thing about that is you can do it in the comfort of your own home. It's not that expensive. It's a lot cheaper than going to an office and getting things done. That would be the place I would start. That is a great place to start. I think everyone's in the market for one right now after you, <laughs> after you shared that story. Well, it's painless too. <laughs> and so what about people who do have the resources to go see a plastic surgeon or a derm? So there are two things that I would look at that I think are great bang for your buck. Um, the first thing is if you are looking for just general uh, tightening of the skin, improvement of the skin, I mentioned earlier that certain treatments use essentially acute inflammation to cause the skin to become more rejuvenated. So once again, the collagen of our skin, and they're like the logs of a log cabin, those logs can become frayed and start falling apart as you get older. There's a treatment called microneedling, very simple. You may have heard of dermal rolling where you take this little roller with pins and you roll it along your face. And what those pins do is they create tiny micro traumas to your skin. Now, most dermatologists and plastic surgeons are not fans of dermal rolling because it can give you a very uneven um, puncture of the skin. It can even tear the skin as it's rolling across the skin. So we don't necessarily recommend that. But what you can do in an office is micro needling where we take an automated device, it has tiny little needles on it, and we can set exactly the depth of the needle penetration that we want. And so essentially what we do is we can go over the skin making these hundreds if not thousands of tiny little needle pokes into the skin. Those needle pokes create acute trauma. And that acute trauma will then damage the collagen of your skin. And as that collagen heals, it heals once again in a tighter fashion, like putting those logs of that, of that log cabin back together nice and tightly. Now, that's the reason why that's a really good treatment and it's great bang for your buck is because the cost of that device, literally I can buy a micro needling handpiece for like $4,000. A laser can cost me $200,000. And the price of the device is going to be passed off onto the patient. So you can get a very similar result in some cases with microneedling than you can with certain lasers, yet it's going to be a fraction of the cost because the overhead cost is much, much less for the doctor or the practitioner. Now, if you want to take that microneedling to the next level, you can apply PRP to it where you draw your blood, uh, remove the blood, remove the platelets, which are chock full of, of growth factors, and then apply that to the surface of the skin. The way that works is those micro needling that creates tiny little pokes in your skin. These tiny little holes in your skin can act as channels so that if you apply growth factor to the surface of the skin, it can seep into those channels and basically reverse aging from the inside out. So that's taking that micro needling to that next level. You're getting the benefit of the trauma to the skin, but you're also getting the benefit of those growth factors seeping into the deep skin to try to benefit it from the inside. And then the even taking that to the next level is a treatment called Morpheus 8. You shared that on Instagram. Yes. So this is something I get done under my neck. And right now it is the gold standard for non-invasive skin tightening. And essentially it starts off making the micro needles, but those needles, okay, they are insulated. So the majority of the needle is insulated and does not have anything other than just the needle, but the tip emits radio frequency energy or heat. And so the idea then is the needle goes into your skin, it emits that radium frequency energy or heat that heats up the collagen to a certain temperature that damages the collagen. So you get that acute inflammation, acute trauma. And as that collagen heals, what does it do? Even tighter, those logs come back together. Uh, and then after you do a microneedling or the Morpheus 8 treatment, you can always throw on some uh, PRP on top of that if you wanna get it that way as well. Um, and all of these are not that expensive compared to, let's say, laser treatments. And that one, the Morpheus 8, tightens the skin under the neck. Yes. Yeah, so that is, I do it under the neck. You can do your whole face. Some people do it uh, on other parts of the body as well. But that right now is the 
gold standard for non-invasive skin tightening. It's not the same as a facelift. It's not going to lift your neck, you know, and get rid of jowls or anything, but it is a nice way to create some mild kind of tightening of the skin. We usually recommend doing three treatments. We space them out a month or two apart. Downtime is a day or two typically max. What's the range of costing on that? Um, depending on how much of an area you treat and where you get it treated at, you could probably get it done for as little as five or $600. If you do the whole face, it can get up there in cost though. I mean, you could get potentially, depending on where you have it done, you can cost over a thousand. And what about the other treatments mentioned? So the other one that I would, uh, well, so I mentioned regular microneedling. You could do regular microneedling. It can cost you maybe $150, maybe even less. Uh, that's really good bang for your buck when you're talking about a cosmetic treatment by an esthetician. Uh, the PRP may add a couple hundred dollars to that. Uh, and then the Morpheus state adds a cost onto that too. That's reasonable. And then the second treatment I would recommend good bang for your buck is IPL, intense pulse light. Uh, and essentially IPL is not the same as a laser. If a laser costs about $200,000 an IPL costs more like a hundred thousand. So still a lot more than that $4,000 microneedling handpiece, but much less than, than a lot of lasers. IPL is a great way to use light energy to basically target dark spots on the skin. So if you've got age spots or sunspots, it can get rid of those very efficiently. It's not painful. Those, those treatments typically run in the several hundreds of dollars, which is a very big difference than several thousands of dollars for certain laser treatments. So what do you think is completely overrated? in terms of procedures that you're seeing on social media right now? Yeah, the number one thing I would say that's overrated is a treatment called the thread lift. Um, there are people getting what's called a fox eye lift nowadays. And what it does is there are these sutures that basically pull the, um, the brows and the eyelids uh, up to make the person look like they've got a curved eyebrow. Some celebrities who have been accused of having it done, there's no evidence you know, that they have, but like uh, Bella Hadid and Ariana Grande, people can, have, have said that they may have had it done, although they've never admitted to it. And I'm not sure that they have. But thread lists are very interesting because what happens in plastic surgery is that we get fad procedures that come and go. Um, so this was something that was initially, you know, I started my practice in 2004 and there were practitioners in 2004, 2005 that started coming up with this idea of thread lists. And essentially what you do is you take a thread, a suture, you cut little bards into it. And if you run that suture underneath the skin, those little bards will kind of hang on to the tissues underneath. And if you run under the skin, you can actually pull some of the skin up with it, making it look like it will be lifted. And so people then took these permanent sutures made of nylon and they cut these little barbs into it and they ran them underneath the skin and they would show people, look at how amazing this lifts the neck or the jowls or the brows and, and look at how amazing this is. And they would charge thousands of dollars for people to have this done. And this is like in the mid to, uh, 2000s. Well, the problem is, is that these, the results would only last about six months because what happens is those tissues will eventually cheese wire through those, those barbs on the sutures because you're not technically changing the anatomy. You're just kind of tugging on it but those sutures were permanent. So people would have, would be lifted for six months and then it would go away, but they would still for years sometimes have these little threads sticking out of their skin that they have to clip because they never dissolved because they were permanent sutures. So come the late to, you know, the like 2010, people had pretty much abandoned this procedure and almost nobody was doing it. Well, fast forward another decade and now you've got a new generation of cosmetic doctors who are like, hey, there's this new treatment called these thread lifts where they put barbs and sutures and they run on the skin and it lifts the face. And they start advertising these as these incredible procedures. And they say, oh yeah, look, Bella Hadid may have had it done and, and Ariana Grande and they charge thousands and thousands of dollars for these treatments and they only last about six months. Now the sutures nowadays are at least absorbable so they're not sticking out of their skin years later, but still the results only last six months, maybe a year at the longest and people are charging thousands and thousands of dollars for it. Uh, so that one definitely, bang for your buck, it's way, way, way overrated. So you mentioned Bella Hadid and Ariana Grande, and th there seems to be a view in popular culture with when it comes to plastic surgery where you don't want too much work done where it becomes like so clear you had a lot of work done. It's almost you want like subtle work where someone says, oh, wow, they look amazing. Like their plastic surgeon must be, where it's just, it's just subtle and it's not too much. And I'm curious, what, what's your take on that? And who's, who's done that well in pop culture where you know they've had work, but it's like on point. It's not overkill and obvious to the world. 
So yeah, no, I think that's the whole thing. And see, when I and I still operate two days a week, two to three days a week. I still do a lot of facelifts. I do a lot of operations. I always use it as a last resort, though. That's the big thing. If I can help auto juvenate them to help them to get where they want to be, that's ideal. But a good facelift is one where people, and I tell my patients this all the time, you know, people are not going to tell you, oh, wow, you had a great facelift. They're going to look at you funny and they'll go, wow, you look great. Did you do something with your hair? You know, is this a new outfit? You know, they don't know because people think plastic surgery, they think, oh, your face is all tight and pulled and looks weird. So some celebrities I think have had really good work done. Helen Mirren is a good example. Now she's getting up there in years, but you know, you look at her like 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, and she had had, I believe, I have no proof of this, but I believe she had a facelift. Um, it's been a while now. It's probably been 15 to 20 years since she had one. But the way I could tell is when she was in her early to mid 60s, she had a perfectly straight and tight jawline. That's the number one red, not really red flag, but that's the number one sign of somebody who's had a good facelift is if you see somebody who's older than 60 and their neckline is perfect, there is almost no way that that is natural. Okay. So that's why Helen Mirren, I'm pretty darn sure has had a facelift is because there's no way that she had that type of a neckline at that age. Another really good example, although I haven't seen her recently and she has gotten older, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. For decades, she looked absolutely fantastic. And that's where she's doing little tweaks. You know, she may have had a facelift at one point, you know, but not overfilling, not overdoing things. I think she's a great example of just really aging very gracefully, but most likely she's had her share of work done. What about Tom Cruise? So Tom Cruise, I think has had some work done as well. I believe he's had a facelift. I think he's recently had some fillers because his face does look a little bit on the puffy side. Um, I also think with Tom that he's one who does auto juvenate. Like I bet you his lifestyle is better than both of ours. Uh, he's probably got a team of nutritionists and uh, chefs, uh, personal trainers. Like, you know, he's, my guess is he's living the cleanest lifestyle anybody can. And that is really slowing down those aging processes. But I have looked at some of his photos pretty carefully. And I do believe at some point he has had a facelift uh, because same deal with him, you know, at his age, he should have more loose skin of his neck than he does. He should have some semblance of jowling, which he really doesn't. This is typically a sign of, of somebody having had a really well done facelift. And I don't see, you know, one way people hide it is that they have hair that hides over their ears. Uh, I was looking at Madonna and Madonna's like, I mean, you either think she, you can, you, you can think she looks great or you can think she looks absolutely terrible. It depends on if her photo is filtered or not. But interestingly enough, if you look at her Instagram page, you will not see any pictures of her, of her ears without her hair over them. None, because that's where the scars are. And she's smart enough to know the hair covers it. She look, you look at it from the side, she's always covering those scars. You cannot see them. Gotta look at the ears. I used to hear you look at the hands and see how the hands compare, the skin of the hands to like the face, the neck, because the hands age. That too. Um, but even with that, there are people who are getting fillers in their hands. Uh, I'm not, I don't do that myself. We do a lot of IPL. So I mentioned IPL is a great way to get rid of dark spots. If you're going to do it on your face, I encourage you do your neck, do your chest. And while you're there, if you want to do your hands as well, I mean, you know, it will help, help with all of that. So I, I think what's been so interesting to me since I've been in this space for, you know, 15 years is we're talking so much more about plastic surgery. This wasn't, I, I know people were doing it 15 years ago. It just wasn't part of the conversation. I think people are a lot more open to this idea of, you know what? Lifestyle is only going to get me 80% there. And I want I want all 100% or whatever that, whatever that number looks like for someone. I also think some of the non-invasive procedures like didn't exist 15 years ago. But, but what's your take on the category in general, I'll say the, the positive as, as well as the negative. Yeah, I think there, there's a lot of positive because yeah, just like you said, when I started my practice in 2004, we had, I think three different fillers available. We had Botox, we had lasers, but since then there are so many technological improvements that have come around and really major advances. So for example, you know, at that time, if you said, hey, I've got some stubborn fat around my midsection that I just cannot get rid of no matter what I do, the only option we had at that time was liposuction. Well, now you've got non-invasive fat reduction using lasers or cool sculpting. So we have one called Sculpture where it heats up the fat to a certain temperature where those fat cells will actually die. 
And you can reduce the thickness of fat completely non-invasively and it definitely works. Now, the results are modest. It's not like lipo, but it really can help for people who've got kind of problem areas that no matter what they do won't go away. I mentioned Morpheus 8, you know, that's a great way to tighten skin. Back when I started my practice, we didn't have anything like that available. We even now have muscle stimulating devices. You know, so one of the real uh, dangerous operations in plastic surgery is BBL surgery. That's the Brazilian butt lift where you take fat from one area, you inject it into the butt. There are, I mean, so many people that have died from this operation. So. So what do you do if you want a perkier rear end other than do squats? Well, there are devices now where you can actually put it onto your, onto your rear end and it will stimulate your gluteal muscles to contract 20,000 times over a half hour session. You know, we're both good friends with Dave Asprey, biohacker. You know, here's a way to biohack your, your butt <laughs> to, to make it perkier and to actually have thicker muscle. Um, so there's a lot of things now that we can do that technology really has enabled us to do. You know, it used to be that Botox was the only toxin available. And I'll tell you, you know, we're friends with a lot of the same uh, healthcare, alternative healthcare influencers, and so many of them are getting Botox. So many, I would say the majority of them are getting Botox over the age of about 35. But now we have one that lasts six months other than the three to four months that it used to be. And we have a plethora of different fillers that are basically meant for every specific kind of facial area. Um, so it just makes things safer. It makes it easier to avoid going under the knife because there are so many of these other options, you know? So even like for double chin fat, we used to, when I started my practice, we could just lipo it, that's it. And we still lipo it sometimes, but now we have injections of Kybella, which is a naturally occurring substance in our GI tract that we can inject to melt the fat away. You can also use those lasers as well. And so I think overall, it's just a really exciting time, but I always start people with those basics, you know, those five basics of autojuvenation of what to eat, when to eat, supplements, skincare products, and then those non-invasive treatments. And I still believe, you know, even with all the great stuff we have available, that that's going to cover the vast majority of people. Another basic, which I feel like has become more controversial recently is the sun. You've got some who say, stay out of the sun, period, sunscreen, everything. And others who say, it's the seed oils, enjoy your sunshine. You need your vitamin D. Don't go maybe sit in the sun for six hours straight when the UV index is 11, you know, but get your morning sun, get your evening sun. You need sun. We've got it all wrong. The sun is your friend. I don't know who to believe anymore. Yeah. I think that in so many things in life, there's so many extremes nowadays. The internet. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got my friends who are dermatology colleagues and they'll put sunscreen on and sit in a basement all day and they still got to wear their sunscreen. And then you've got people, you know, I mean, I did an interview with the guy, super great guy. And he was like asking me, well, Dr. Yuna, I just put lard on my face. Isn't that enough? Like sun protection? Of course. <laughs> so the way I come from it, I think like anything that the truth, the ideal is somewhere in between usually, you know? Um, and so the way I come from it basically with sun protection is this, you know, as a plastic surgeon, I have seen patients come into my office with skin cancers on their face. And I get people that say, oh, they got this little dot on their nose. And I say, well, why don't you go see a dermatologist? They get mows done. Then they come back to see me a couple months later and half their nostril is gone. I tell you, I'm afraid, one of my favorite actors, Hugh Jackman, I am afraid for him because I mean, I think he is the most talented person in Hollywood and he has had multiple skin cancers. At some point, one of those cancers is gonna show up on his eyelid or on his nose or something like that. And, and he could be permanently disfigured from it. So you do not, you do not want to get a skin cancer on your face, period. Take that from me. However, I also see there's a massive benefit psychologically and possibly metabolically of getting sun, especially early in the morning with your circadian rhythms and things. So where is there a good medium? So my recommendation in general, you know, I don't wear sunblock every day. If I'm gonna be out in the sun during the day, then I always will wear it. Um, but at the same time, I think that it's choosing the sunblock that you use, okay? So there's a difference between sunscreen and sunblock. Sunscreens are chemical where the sun hits your, your skin those chemical sunscreens are absorbed into your skin, uh, even into your bloodstream, and they will create basically a chemical reaction to block the, um, the effects of those UV rays on your skin. Some block in the form of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide are sitting on the surface of your skin, and they physically will block those sun's rays from getting to your skin. That is the ideal, are the sun blocks, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. However, those are pretty thick, and if you're a person of color, 
you know you put that on your skin and your skin color changes. Uh, and so most people don't like that. So my recommendation in general with sunblocks and sunscreens are for your children, put sunblock on them. They don't care if you're at the beach and they're pasty white, they don't care. They're just jumping in the water and having fun. So use sunblock on the kids and never ever spray the sunscreen all over them because you know they're breathing those particles into their mouth, into their mouth, into their lungs, and they don't need that, that potential hormone disrupted substances into their lungs. For adults, in general, I do recommend uh, using the, the physical sunblocks, but the problem is, is if you are a person of color or if you don't like kind of how heavy that feels, you have to be careful with which chemical sunscreens to use. Avoid oxybenzone and octanoxate. Those are potential hormone disruptors. Those have been shown to potentially damage the coral reefs. You wanna stick with avobenzone or Megzoral XL, ideally. Those are chemical sunscreens that have been shown to be safe. They aren't endocrine or hormone disruptors, and they are gonna feel light on your skin. Uh, and so that's in general what I recommend. For me, I will use those chemical sunscreens on my face. And then for the body, I try to go in general with the, the physical blockers. And with the kids, definitely go with the physical stuff. I'm curious, any favorite brands come to mind? So we have one um, I saw in my online store called La Roche-Posay. Uh, and I think that's a good one. There's a couple other ones like Zio Skin Health has got some good ones. Really, I think it's, it's unfortunately not necessarily getting the copper tone at the store. It's going online and find them. And you know, a lot of my colleagues now, they're going to Korea because the problem with sunscreens is here in the United States, there's such a limited number of them available because they have to go through an FDA approval process because they are treated like drugs. And most of these cosmetic companies are not gonna do that. And so we have a very limited number of options available here in the US. A lot of people now I hear are ordering from other countries, getting much thinner sunscreens that seem to work really well and feel much better on their skin. You know, cause you know, there's a difference, you know, Jason, if you just apply moisturizer on your skin in the morning and you head out the door versus applying a sunscreen, like you can feel that sunscreen on your face all day. Whereas if you do a moisturizer, you don't. And ideally, that's what a sunscreen should feel like, as if you just put a moisturizer on. Interesting. Yeah, I think the one we buy, uh, the name is escaping me, but I think it's from Australia, now that you say it. Yeah, so they, other countries, they have many more sunscreens than we do. I'm not sure about the testing. That's the only thing, you know. Are there SPF, you know, how rigid is their testing to make sure that it works? Because there have been controversies with some sunscreens where people get burned and, you know, and they, they shouldn't necessarily. Um, but the other countries have the access to these that are going to feel more like we do when we just feel, you know, when we just put moisturizer on our skin. And I think that would help so much more with compliance uh, if we had better sunscreens here in the U.S. But the cost of getting a sunscreen ingredient approved by the FDA, it's like getting a drug approved. And where's their, you know, where's the monetary, you know, incentive for them to do that? There just really isn't one. It's interesting. I had no idea it was that intensive from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, yeah, I mean, because, you know, they they put out a drug like uh, Ozempic or Viagra, and they can make billions and billions off of that in a very short period of time. A sunscreen ingredient? Unfortunately, there's not the money in that. Interesting. So we covered a lot of ground today. Uh, other than pick up the book, Younger for Life, which I'll hold up, which is excellent. Other than, than buy the book, which I encourage everyone to do, anything... Uh, we haven't touched on that you'd like to touch on or like to leave our audience with any parting words of wisdom? Yeah, I mean, I think um, other than buying the book, I think it's so important that you control your aging in your own hands. And it really comes down to the fact that your body has regenerative abilities to literally rejuvenate itself. And you just have to give it the tools to do so. That's the thing. And, and by following a lot of things that Jason talks about here on the podcast, um, by following the principles that I give on auto-juvenation in my book, you will give your body those tools to literally regenerate itself. And you will not need a plastic surgeon or a dermatologist to stick needles in you or anything like that. Um, if you are thinking about getting the book, one thing that I always encourage people to do is go to bookshop.org. Um, bookshop.org is an online marketplace similar to like Amazon, where you can actually choose the bookstore uh, of your choice. Like if you have a local indie bookstore, you can actually choose it. And if you order the book there, that local bookstore will get the profit from that sale. Um, so we always encourage people to support their local independent bookstores, and this is a great way to do it, bookshop.org. Just make sure you choose that bookstore. It'll give you a list of different ones in your area. Choose the one that's your favorite and make sure you send the money to them uh, instead of some huge company. Very cool. Tony, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Jason.